Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the outbreak. The theater is officially disbanded. As well as other conveniences, running water, access to your own children, who never leave their beloved polyhedron anyway. Beginnings are difficult. Some would say it's the most difficult part of any process, creative or otherwise. Staring at a black canvas and wondering where to put your brush is terrifying, because not only do you get choice paralysis, but that first stroke is bound to define the work as a whole. This is probably why so many works start with a well-established phrase such as a long, long time ago or in this thing I like, there is a scene. It puts something on the canvas and lets you work from there. But no matter what, you have to make that first step. Even in a discussion you can't talk about a blank slate, but when you're paralyzed with choice, when you don't know which tool to grab first, what else can you do? And that is exactly the problem that many people have when discussing Pathologic 2 and trying to present it to others, myself included. It's such a dense monolith, so vast in size that it's really hard to decide where to put your chisel and make the first chip. And when you do, you take a step back and it didn't even seem to scratch the surface. You can't just take a part of it and focus on it, as the many interconnected systems and personal stories all work in service of the main narrative throughline. The game requires a holistic approach when thinking about it, and that really, really doesn't lend itself well to elevator peer discussions. This is a really big problem when you have to market the game. If you can't describe the figure you see under all that marble, how can anyone else? With Pathologic 2 in particular, this has been… trying over the years? The game never got much coverage before release, and what has been there seemed either impenetrable or vague as all hell. You can only say that something is weird or difficult so many times before boring your listener to tears. Often it has been described as non-standard in video games, disempowering, not a heroic power fantasy, but even that doesn't seem to make it distinctive, at least not in the way that I feel this game is truly unique and one of a kind, existing in a category all of its own where only a few other titles dwell, most notably other productions by the studio I Speak Lodge. There's a lot of games with disempowering gameplay, the entire genres of stealth and horror come to mind. There are a lot of games that are tough as nails to beat and serve as a real challenge, be it of dexterity, reaction speed or planning. There's also a lot of great writing in the video game medium, writing that steps out of the confines of a power fantasy. I don't even know why the community as a whole keeps being that insecure about that. Every time any game has a theme deeper than end of the world is pretty bad, stop it. Only you can do it because your dick is huge! The world at large treats it as some groundbreaking achievement. Planescape Torment is over 20 years old, guys. It certainly has more poignant themes and writing than, say, the later seasons of Game of Thrones or all the books that instantly landed in the bargain bin. Stop saying video game story like it's derogatory. It's a young medium, but not one without history. And that inferiority complex is the first step into discussing Pathologic 2, because that game is the ultimate vote of confidence for the artistry of Electronic Plays. A project almost a decade and a half in the making, based on the sole premise that video games as we know them, the interactive virtual landscape, are the next frontier of art. The studio that made the game, I Speak Lodge, began with a manifesto in 2001, titled The Deep Game, in which the founding members described their mission as creating a game that invokes a sense of catharsis, purification of emotion through pity and fear. In this process, the player is not a consumer, but the co-author of the story, a part as integral as the code, making the end result something that can only ever truly be achieved in a video game. I think. That is the important part we need to keep in mind as we move forward, the proper starting point for talking about Pathologic 2. So with that smudge of paint on the canvas, what exactly is this game? It is a remake quell of the first Pathologic, which came out in 2005. Originally intended as nothing more than an extra layer of graphical and mechanical polish, it morphed into its own story during development because the authors changed quite a bit as people over the years. Sometimes spiritually and sometimes literally, as not everyone that worked on Pathologic 2 was even an adult when the first game came out. 
I do recommend playing the first game if you can handle a game so janky that it could only be made by a studio with a director that didn't know that coding 2D and 3D are two different beasts. If not, start with 2. It is a retelling of the same ideas, and I do think it is more valuable as a dialogue between you and the creators overall, as after all this time and other games under the studio's belt, they know exactly what topic they want to talk with you about. Mor, as it's called in native Russian, is a survival horror game about 12 days in a doomed town in the middle of the Eurasian steppe. As a mysterious plague hits the settlement, it dissolves before your very eyes, physically, morally, spiritually. And you cannot hide from that rot as you play the role of a healer, someone very rare in that small town. But of course, you cannot save anyone if, in the first place, you cannot save yourself, putting you in a position of constantly having to ask yourself whether you can actually afford to help someone else. The mechanical heart behind the story is quite simple. Traverse the open world of the town on Gorkon River, match the needs of your body, and try to find a cure for the deadly disease. However, unlike most survival games, it's rather hard to fall into the safety of a routine. The town changes with each day, the economy shifts, the characters die, the plague spreads. We will not feel the comfort of a home base you've built as there is simply not enough time to get a good night's sleep, let alone make your bed. Every aspect of the game's design is tailor-made to put you in the shoes of someone who carries the burden of saving tens of thousands of people from an enemy they know nothing about. And it is as heavy, stressful and uncomfortable as that sounds. The game directly asks you to not just play the character, but over trials and tribulations to become them, to make the fictional person imbue you with a part of them at the same time as you, the actor, imprint yourself onto them. The original game had three storylines, the Bachelor, the Harrowspecs and the Changeling, but Logic 2 only has the second one for the time being. Creating the game was costly, both in time and resources, and I speak Lodge decided to release what they have rather than drag it for even longer and potentially die in the process. Which is, quite ironically, on point with the game's themes. The other two will come, the interviews confirmed as much, but the team is taking a break from the town on Gorkon for the time being. But, back to the work itself. A native to the region, Artemy Burach, left his hometown to study medicine in the capital and is now a trained surgeon. One day, he receives a letter from his father asking him to come back as he fears great trouble brewing. Artemy is also a part of the local steppe culture of cow herders called the Kin, a culture that clashes with and is exploited by the industrialized town. They aren't exactly happy he left the community for so long, so it's up to the Haruspex to prove himself to still be one of them or not. Which direction you take the story is up to you. The moment the young surgeon steps out of the train, he has to kill three people in self-defense, his father turns up murdered, the man that was like a brother to him blames him for patricide, and his other childhood friends are estranged and cold because of how much time passed since they last saw him. And that's day one. The titular plague didn't even appear yet. Suffice to say the game goes and goes hard on the misery of the situation. Unlike, say, Resident Evil, Pathologic is not the kind of survival horror where you get a sense of satisfaction from growing stronger and eventually overpowering the things that terrified you initially. It is a game of never-ending attrition and balancing. Do you value finishing a quest line or getting enough sleep? People you know are endangered by the plague, but you only have one cure. Do you keep it to yourself or risk getting to their house to deliver it? None of this is a scripted binary choice. All this is a part of emergent storytelling that stems from the game's mechanics. You could have had more cures, you just needed to spend the time finding the resources and distilling it. And the time is always ticking, it seeps through your fingers like sand. Quite honestly, the plague is only as terrifying as it is because of the clock mechanic. With each day people die, with every one of your heartbeats your body grows more tired and hungry as the microbe, free from such perils, does its work. Your regrets pile up, the list of your options grows shorter, a person holding a crucial clue will not postpone their death to tell it to you, your body will not heal itself to give you a heroic second win just because you need to be in 10 different places at the same time. Tick. Tock. Tick. Tock. Tick.
fuck. This is where that faith in video games as art is at its strongest. Pathologic never grabs your hand to say, okay darling, you might be a bit upset because we want you to feel something in this particular moment. Do you want to shoot this dog or this baby? It has absolute trust that you will draw your own conclusions and act on what you feel is right in this particular situation. The difficulty of the game was fine-tuned to make you part of the plagued city rather than a tourist. Resources are scarce, your needs are many, you can die just as fast as you can kill, and when the game says the plague is incurable, it does not make an exception for you. You cannot help anyone if you're dead, but where do you draw the line between pragmatism and selfishness? Of course, all of this would be meaningless if you only cared about your own skin, which is why it's important to notice that the character writing in Pathologic 2 is excellent. There are over 30 characters, and while Artemy only ever has meaningful relationships with a third of them, after all that's why the game is meant to have three protagonists, every single one of them is a theme and a story of their own, often in conflict with the beliefs and motivations of other characters within the same narrative. To describe them all would be a video of its own, and others, like Sulmatul, already did a banger job on that, so I'll wait until all three routes are out. And each of these stories can be suddenly cut short because nobody in the story gets special treatment, there is no karmic justice that keeps the righteous alive and kills the wicked. The hand of the director will not stay the knife of fate because it agrees with some character's personal philosophy. Death is a literal die roll. And you can, at best, stack it in the favor of those you find worth preserving. That is, if you find it morally comfortable to pick favorites despite your Hippocratic Oath, of course. That is not to say there is no levity to it, because Artemy has an amazingly dry sense of humor. It's probably not to everyone's taste, but it is extremely in line with the kind of gallows humor that a lot of doctors have in real life. Even as the situation grows desperate, you probably have at least one option to tell some children to throw things at your colleague for being an asshole. There is a lot of personality to your dialogue options in general, yet you're always given a choice in how Artemy approaches things. Does he welcome the chance to visit his hometown, or does he hate that place? Is he prone to threats and violence, or willing to let a lot of stuff slide? The character is defined, but you, as an actor, are as important to giving him a personality as the script is. Oh yeah, I should also cover all the theater stuff. There is a lot of that in Pathologic, a lot, a lot, a lot. The game is framed as a really big stage play and uses that framing to discuss anything that has anything to do with things outside of the context of the story, such as addressing the player directly or explaining the game mechanics. I saw a lot of people confused with that, like folks seeing the tragedy and going, oh, what kind of monster are you? Dude, that's a mime, a stagehand. Did you not have your teachers take you to a theater as a child? Please go to a theater on your own. Live performance is a fantastic experience that far too few of us appreciate. Just, uh, you know, maybe not at the time of this video's release, after the actual, real, certainly less deadly, but just a serious pandemic is over. Anyhow, I think it's a fantastic thing. A lot of games try to draw from movies or TV for some reason, I assume because they are all relatively new art forms and are engaged with using a shining box. But theater has so much more in common with video games. The presented actions have to be clear and engaging from any presented angle to interest the audience wherever they are seated. The lines can be flubbed, the steps taken wrong, it's all live. The actors can engage with the audience directly and vice versa. The lights are used to direct your attention. A million different actors can take on the same role, each of them feeling differently about it. All of this makes the direct theatrical elements weave into the game in a great way. Certainly much better than, say, trying to divide games into episodes or apply movie cinematography to them. This directly ties to another vague point that is mentioned a lot when talking about Pathologic 2, that it is weird. It's easy to say why someone would say that. Not only is the theatrical framing alien to a lot of people, the fictional culture of the kin is intentionally drawn as the polar opposite of the modern positivist mindset. Then, 
There's the cultural context of the game being made by Russian fine arts graduates that do not shy away from metaphors, ambiguity and quoting literature. The English translators did not try to downplay that grandeur either. The tragedians, those gangly theatre fellows mentioned earlier, speak in a yambic pentameter. Death, a force so much older than civilization, speaks in English, a version of English that does not use loan words from different languages. Even the visual design of the game is meant to convey more than just one image at once, as admitted by the game's artbook. Combine that with the game's refusal to hold your hand and that is a lot to take in. The difficulty that drives people away is more about the difficulty to approach the story with absolutely no frame of reference given to you. However, the word weird doesn't convey that properly. Saying penis at the end of every sentence is certainly weird, but it doesn't make it interesting or meaningful. And meaningful is actually the proper word to use here, in my opinion. Every single part of Pathologic 2 is meaningful. Every quest, every choice, every line of dialogue, every visual cure or musical note. Not a single element of it is superfluous and made to confuse you or as a cheap tactic to throw a punch out of the left field. It is not nihilistic droll that engages in misery and torment for the sake of telling you that you are a fool for believing in anything. For, again, it was made with the utmost trust in you as a co-author that you will endure and connect the lines that tie every element of this puzzle together. That you, as them, can find reason to play a video game other than having fun. For, while the medium does excel at providing exactly that, there is space for titles that do other things, tap into different emotions, and Pathologic 2 is one of them. Certainly not the first, but I definitely think that is the most confident one. Of course, that is not everybody's cup of tea. Not everyone is willing to do 20 to 30 hours of management, juggling choices and reading two volumes of War and Peace worth of dialogue. The game's code is a piece of junk with long load times. It is out only in English and in Russian natively, with Chinese and Portuguese fan translations out. But if anything in this video even remotely made you interested, please give it a try. This game deserves so much more than the press it received. Even some reviews praising this game to high heavens couldn't talk about what makes it special, saying we do not have the vocabulary for it in our young medium. Bullshit, I say. For a piece of art this confident in the medium it chose, we do not need to develop new terms to talk about it. Merely view them through a lens of different values. There is a gameplay loop, but one that is used to postpone torment rather than bring gratification and one that will punish you if you do not properly respond to the signs that it is about to change. There is a system of morality, but one that asks you to draw conclusions on the ethics of your actions on your own, and merely reflects how others view your acts. There is choice and consequence, never taken from you, nor handed to you on a silver platter. There is resource management, one geared towards making you always lack something, even if that something is, in the best possible scenario, inventory space. There is character progression, both extrinsic as your mechanical options expand and intrinsic as you learn what exactly makes this bizarre world tick. There is game feel, one of deliberate hostility that turns even the smallest of victories into beautiful accomplishments. There is side content, mixed with the critical path in an intricate web so that the choice of which is which lies squarely on your judgement. Conversely, there is a simple failure state, giving up. Not just on trying to beat the game, but giving up on trying to take the pieces it gives you to create a complete picture. There are mechanical incentives, not guiding you towards certain actions, but deterring from them. For example, why would you seek out fights that can spell your death if each defeat carries consequences and a victory carries marginal rewards, if any at all? And most of all, there is a ludonarrative resonance between gameplay and the story, as one cannot exist without the other. 
How can you genuinely tell a story of survival and struggle against tremendous odds without stacking the entire deck against the player? And the reverse of that. How can you contextualize mechanics this punishing if not by a story of confusion and perseverance? As I said in the beginning, it is a work that needs to be approached on a holistic level and it makes it difficult to talk about. But it also makes it so, so worthwhile and unique in the video game landscape. As closing words, a quote from one of the anonymous developers that can be found in the game. If you consider this to be spoilers, close the video now, for there is nothing beyond it. I like it. It's the story of strong people in a tough situation. A story of responsibility, the will to cleanse your doubts, the power to go on despite exhaustion and mistakes, the wrongness and incomprehensibility. It's hard, but meaningful. And I am happy to be here. One of my first videos, now in a not garbage quality. I'm hoping to push out one more original video before the year ends, we'll see how it goes. This work was made possible thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters Kvadracik and DropZZ, as well as this wonderful anonymous coffee donation. Every kind of support goes a long way in fighting off my imposter syndrome and letting me create more stuff. Have a good December. See you later.